When Edmund was no more than a tiny speck in the distance, Terry sighed lightly and looked around him. He had often crossed the sea before, he had been across the Channel, and he had even been to Marseilles in Algiers, but he had never been on a boat like this one. All the other boats he had been on had plunged up and down from bow to stern. His father had told him this was called pitching, as well as from side to side, which was called rolling. It was the rolling which had made Terry seasick, but this boat didn't do any rolling. It was so long and thin that it only pitched. Terry felt quite comfortable, and he was very hungry. All sorts of things were happening on deck. Everybody seemed to be walking or running or giving orders. Numerous hawkers were going about carrying little trays loaded with newspapers, books, magnifying glasses, watches and tape measures. Terry hoped that one of them might also be selling chocolates or bananas, but not one of them sold anything to eat. Through the windows of the saloon, he could see a lot of men doing gymnastics. Some were lifting heavy weights, others were throwing a ball to one another, and others, seated in mechanical boats, were pulling away as if they were rowing. It all made Terry think of the windows of the big shops at Christmas time, when they are full of mechanical figures which never stop moving. But soon he was struck by something even more surprising. Although there was such a large number of people aboard, there wasn't a single one who was fat or even moderately plump. All of them, men, women and children, were dreadfully, dreadfully thin. One could see the bones through their cheeks. There was no flesh on their hands and their clothes hung loosely about them. In spite of this, they did not seem in the least bit ill. On the contrary, they appeared to be in the best of health and extremely active and vigorous. But it was plain that this was a most peculiar race of people and almost unbelievably thin. Where am I? Terry wondered. He thought of all the people he had seen on his travels, but he couldn't think of a country where all the people were thin. And anyway, he had never heard of a country that she reached by going down a moving staircase. Thinking this over, and presently, as he passed a room on which the words writing room, he noticed a large map in a frame. He examined it with growing surprise, because it was not in the least like any map he had ever seen, and it did not contain a single name he knew. He examined it for a long time. Although he had been third out of 37 in geography, he could not remember anything at all about this strange country. And while he was racking his brains, an elderly, white-haired, very thin gentleman stopped beside him and gazed at him sternly. Aha, he said, from the surface. Who, me? said Terry. Yes, you. You came down the stairs, didn't you? Yes, said Terry. We did. Precisely, said the elderly gentleman. Exactly what I said, from the surface. Down here we don't understand your surface countries where you mix fat and thin people without making any difference between them. Under the earth the races are properly separated. There are fatty puffs and there are thinifers. And I suppose the fatty puffs are all fat and the thinifers are all thin said Terry. Intelligent child, said the old gentleman teasingly. He has grasped it all by himself. Ten marks out of ten. He was a sarcastic and unpleasant old person, but Terry wanted to find out where he was, so he continued the conversation. He learned that his companion was called Mr Dulcifer and that he was Professor of History at the Thinifer National Academy. It would, in any case, have been easy to guess he was a professor, because he was always asking questions. Name the capital of Thinifer, he said suddenly. Who, me? said Terry. Of course you, there's no one else, is there? We, said Terry, we've learnt Italy, capital Rome, Poland, capital Warsaw, Hungary, capital Budapest, but no one ever taught us about Thinifer. Not, said Mr Dulcifer, repeat after me, the capital of Thinifer is Thinneville. Terry repeated this. Now then, the capital of Fatty Puff, said Mr Dulcimer. I'm not sure, said Terry, is it Fattyville? Five out of ten, said Mr Dulcifer. Repeat after me, the capital of Fatty Puff is Fattyborough. Well, that's easy to remember, said Terry. 
I only wish the capital of Sweden was Swedeville and the capital of Greece, Greaseborough. Silence, said Mr Dulcifer. Drawing Terry in front of the map, he continued, The staircase by which you arrived, which links the two races in the centre of the earth with the people on the surface, is known as the stairway to the surface. Its upper entrance is concealed between two rocks in a forest. I know that, said Terry, rubbing his back. The harbour at the foot of the staircase is known as surface by the sea. It is highly important because it is the terminus both of the fatty puff line to fatty port and of the thinner for line to thinner port, said Terry. Ten out of ten, said Mr Dulcifer. Now, if you look at the map, you will see that the kingdom of the fatty puffs is separated from the Republic of the Thinifers, first by a land frontier across the desert of Sandy Puff, and then by a gulf, which we call the Yellow Sea, because of the golden coloured rocks at the bottom, which give it a quite unusual appearance. The Yellow Sea is almost closed in the south by two capes, Cape Patacake and Cape Nailhead. I see, said Terry, and in the middle there's an island called the Island of Thinipuff. Exactly, said Mr Dulcifer, and I wish that island were at the bottom of the sea, because it is the cause of all of our troubles. But before going on with Mr Dulcifer's history and geography lesson, we really ought to see what happened to Edmund.